bit about cosmology. Let's talk a little bit about that. What do you think? Okay, let's do it. Let's okay, do it. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So, do we want to talk? Uh, so, young earth creationists like to talk about Big Bang a lot, um, and I think they think if you don't like, so Big Bang completely different process than solar system formation. <laughs> right right yeah oh yeah they rarely talk about solar system formation <laughs> i my favorite thing and i, I want to see your reaction to this this mm -hmm. is one of my favorites i've seen creation i've probably heard this four or five times uh mostly here on youtube but mm -hmm. uh, they say don't you know we've never seen a star form <gasps> okay okay i've got a rant ready to go on this I'm are ready. you ready I'm re I'm are you ready I'm re okay I'm re all right true um, so it takes a long, 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 long time <laughs> for a star to form. That is absolutely factual. Um, but here's my little analogy. Um, you have also never seen a car be made, right? You have never, no person on planet Earth has ever watched um, a car go from un, like just raw iron or in right. the ground, <laughs> right? to Full fruition. a Ford Mustang, yeah. <laughs> right? And watched every single step along the way. But we could go to an iron mine and watch the ore get mined. We could go to like, I don't know, is smelting the right word? Whatever that factory. Yeah, they, they make called. it into the thing. They turn it right. into the <laughs> Yeah, so we take the raw iron ore and turn it into something usable. I think then that goes separately to a steel plant, right? So then we turn that into like steel then let's just go i'm skipping steps i'm sure yeah. take that steel to a car plant um and build the car and then take that car uh from the plant to like a dealership right, right. we could go to each of those places and watch the process we're not tracking the same iron atoms mm -hmm. that we watch get dug out of the ground but we can see every single step in the process right so Correct. We have not seen a single star be formed because we've only had telescopes for a few hundred years yep. and we need millions to make a star. Yeah. Right? But we can point our lovely telescopes at a stellar nursery and see where things start. And we can point them at um, like proto, uh, pro like proto solar systems and proto stars. And we can point to stars that are like our sun, right? That are alive and kicking. And then we can point to late stage stars. So like red giants, right? Mm -hmm. And then we can point our telescope to something going supernova right now, or something that didn't go supernova, but turned into like a white dwarf or a brown dwarf, right? Um, so we can watch every phase of the process, just not with the same star because it takes millions of years. Yeah, it's it's this idea of like, I, I love that car analogy. I The one I always think of is like animation. Um, mm -hmm. An animation of, that takes a minute, right, might have thousands of frames. Right. And you could take every 10 and get the big picture of what's going on in that animation. Mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't think that, you know, a, me, a one picture of me having my arm here and one having it here, that in between it wasn't something intermediate. Uh, particularly right. if you did some digging and then you found every fifth frame and then maybe you found every three frames you know and you're mm -hmm. filling in those gaps constantly uh but i think a car analogy is perfect too because no one is there for the no one has stood witness to every single step from my right. new, from beginning to end from the first pickaxe strike to person driving it off the lot right. of, of a car formation you don't have to that's not even that's not applicable to anything not even right. observable science here uh, on terra firma, like disease progression, for example, right, yeah. very similar. Um, so I think that's a great example. I I wanted to know I, because one of my favorite things, my go to with with creationism and uh, cosmology tends to be okay. First and foremost, it's just the speed of light that that yeah. definitively precludes it. Would you mm -hmm. explain a little bit of that to to kind of everyone here? How how distant starlight tells us the the age of pretty much the, the universe, but then also afterwards, I wanted to know if you've heard of uh, Jason Lyle's white hole hypothesis. I I haven't heard of that specifically. I think I can guess where it's going. Okay, all right, I, okay. Let, let's jump in, let's jump in. 
All right. So light guys, light is the most surprising thing in the universe, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. It behaves very strangely and it behaves unlike anything else uh, that we've ever observed. But no matter how many times we measure it, right? Because scientists are like, this was discovered around Einstein's time. Um, And that is uh, that the speed of light in a vacuum is a non-reference frame dependent constant. Um, And so what that, okay, so the way I like to explain this, if I am driving in a car going 40 miles an hour this way, and there's another car going 40 miles an hour this way, I in this car will observe this car to travel 80 miles an hour because the gap between us is closing at 80 miles an hour. Similarly, if both cars were going 40 miles an hour parallel in the same direction, we would not measure the other car to be moving. Right. Okay. So now I'm in my car, the other car is coming at me. And as it's coming at me, it has a laser pointer, right? Mm -hmm. And instead of measuring the speed of the car, I measure the speed of that light. I measure the laser pointer and I measure it to be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now we're going the same direction, right? (laughs) We're moving with it and we fire the laser pointer and I measure it to be three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Doesn't matter how you look at it. Doesn't matter how fast you are going. It's always three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And that is weird, right? (laughs) It's so weird. We measure it all the time just to be sure it hasn't changed. That's the, that's that's the, did I turn the oven off of like science? It's like, yeah, absolutely positive. (laughs) I remember when I was an undergrad, there was a thing it was at, I think it was at CERN. um, And there was a paper that came out that was like, guys, we measured light different. We don't know what we did wrong. Please help. Yeah. <laughs> right. Experiencing um, a matrix level glitch. We yeah. this is a you know, DEFCOM black mirror. Everyone get over here now. <laughs> yeah. And every physicist on the planet was reading this paper. I as an undergraduate student was reading this paper because here's the thing. If if they were right changes a lot of changes a lot that would be very exciting so i think there's this myth amongst younger creationists that scientists are like no no it can't be right we have to bury that evidence yeah no 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 we were like oh my god did they oh my god that'd be so cool they couldn't have right but oh my god that'd be so cool right (laughs) it's it's the same thing and we we said this earlier but it's the same thing with the living dinosaur stuff right it's like i would kill for there to be a loch ness monster i would love for there to be an extant plesiosaur hanging out in some Scottish lake. Like that would be amazing, but unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, continue. Yeah. I'm poor, like, uh, so like, so anyway, so speed of light is very strange like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but because of that, uh, since the speed of light is, is a fixed value, I'm um, traveling through a vacuum, which is space. Um, uh, a star that is, you know, a million light years away, um, took, it took a million years for that light to get to us. Right. right? So um, we can backtrack and figure out how far away is the furthest thing, right? Um, And then that tells us, you know, that tells us uh, we know how long stuff took to get here. So that tells us how far away it is, et cetera, so forth. Um, uh, And since light does not slow down, (laughs) right? Um, That's very important. Um, What, what What was the closure with that paper? Oh, the closure with that paper was uh, there was an instrument that wasn't calibrated right. Okay. Um, um, and they finally found it, but it took like all every physicist on the planet digging through their methodology to figure it out, oh. which I actually think is a great example of how science works. Yeah, you, know? that you gotta love love it or hate it, peer review, man. Yeah. That, it gets it done. Gets it, it gets done. it done, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, uh, other things that we see um, with like how big is the universe, um, we do see uh, like a uh, redshift of stuff, redshift of light. Right. So that's it's the, itself expanding, right? Yep. So it's kind of the light equivalent of the Doppler effect, um, if you know what that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, what got us to like Big Bang, and this is something that, I, that I've never heard a young Earth creationist like talk about, um, is uh, the, 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 two, the two reasons that like, the big bang theory became a theory, right? Mm-hmm. One, if we measure 
um, any object in the universe, right? We measure how far away it is. We, we measure it to be moving away from us. And we also measure it to be moving away from everything else. So every object we can point a telescope at is not only moving away from us, but it's moving away from everything else. Right. So if, if things are further apart now, they used to be closer together. Backtrack that in time, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So there's that. And then the other thing is going to be uh, background microwave radiation, right? So point a telescope to empty sky, you get a signal. <laughs> okay, this is kind of the nice story, right? You're a young rascally scientist. You're manning um, a, a, a big radio telescope. Right. Um, and you're getting a signal when you shouldn't, right? So think of it as like your telescope is not pointing at anything and you're getting a sound, right? You're getting, sorry, I say sound because it's like white noise, right? Right, a, 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 a ping or something, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're, but you're getting a signal and it's electromagnetic radiation, right? Mm -hmm. So um, now it's, so it's going to be that mi microwave range. So uh uh, not light, not uh, visible light anymore. Right. Um, so that background radiation, it's everywhere. It's, you can point your telescope anywhere you like, right? And these guys like cleaned the telescope, cleaned the bird poop off the telescope because they right. thought that was interfering, right? They, they could not, th this is like, this can't be right. We don't know what this is, blah, blah, blah. Um, they w w broke down and cleaned the telescope and they were still getting um, this signal. Um, and what, what this is, is this, is this is the echo of the Big Bang, mm -hmm. right? That was such a massively energetic event, right? Uh, so that released a lot of energy, energy mostly in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Right. At the time, it would have been incredibly high energy and consequently um, high frequency, short wavelength. Um, uh, yeah, um, but over time it loses energy. Um, but since the speed of light is constant, when electromagnetic radiation loses energy, what that does is it lowers the frequency and raises the wavelength. Right. right. So a radio wave is uh, physically the same thing as gamma radiation or an x-ray. It's just, um, the, it the just height, has less right. energy. Okay. Right. Like it's in all, the yeah, it's all the beautiful electromagnetic spectrum. So over the 14 billion years, the universe has been around that energy has, it's lost energy. Um, so the way, the nature of the wave has changed. Right. But you, so you can, it, this microwave background is everywhere. Right. And that's the only thing that is so, so the thing that made it <laughs> had to have happened everywhere. Right. Right. So we know we have a huge energetic event that happened everywhere simultaneously. Mm -hmm. We know everything, literally everything is moving further apart. So it had to used to have been closer together. Right. Put those two pieces of data together and you get big bang. So, so how... Okay, so for folks out there who may not know, this this is all very damning stuff to, to young Earth creationism. Um, they tend to take the perspective of like, okay, well, maybe God made everything already in motion. Maybe things were created to look old, um, but that tends to be like a like a very theologically untenable position. Because then you've got to okay, this is okay, so. The apparent age, Dr. Josh has brought this up yep. before, right? That he like thought about Dr. This. Josh is great. Oh, I love him. Awesome. <laughs> I used to hang out with him on Skylar Fiction. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. he's great. He's so good. His Kent Hoven impression is <sighs> legend, legend. Love. But uh, he says like, okay, if you cut down a tree in the Garden of Eden, would it have rings? Mm -hmm. And an Adam, you know, wasn't a baby. He looked old. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that statement of apparent age so much. I hold that if you cut down a tree in the Garden of Eden, it would not have tree rings because tree rings specifically form by like, we grew a little bit, then we stopped. Then we grew a little bit, then we stopped. If it grew continuously, right, wouldn't have tree rings too. Yeah. 
Adam may look look 30, but his telomeres would be really long. They would be. Yeah. They right? Because be. he wouldn't get that cell division. He um, also lived to be like old as shit too. Right. So that's weird. That's, that's weird. So here's my thing on a parent age, right? If you, if you make things, it, like if you're going to make a tree in a day, right? It's not going to get tree rings unless you use your magic to make it have tree rings. So here's the thing with a parent age. If, if, if you're going to believe in a parent age, my, my guys, my team, um, you have to accept that God is intentionally being deceptive. I, I agree that I 100% agree with you there also because there's this concept of reading, having a good exegesis, right? Where you're, you're reading the Bible through the lens of the Bible. Yeah. And it's very consistent with how God's character is in certain ways. Some things seem to change a little here and there, like Old Testament God is pretty different from New Testament God, but yeah. some things are pretty consistent, uh, all knowing. Uh, all powerful. Uh, and another one is just, and another one is truthful. He's, and, he's honest. And like Lucifer, uh, that actually, that the character of Satan is very interesting. Welcome to things I've been thinking about recently. <laughs> yeah. But is very, but one of the titles of, you know, a, a, the, a, an enemy <laughs> in the Bible is specifically the Prince of Lies. Yeah, or the right. deceiver, right? The deceiver, the, the deceiver or the accuser, the prince of lies. Right. So that, that idea um, that lying is very much not presented um, as in the character of the God of the Bible. Right, Exa exactly. So, and, and creationists tend to have that position as well. Many of them are not comfortable with this idea of created age. And so you'll get mm -hmm. guys like Andrew Snelling who will say, okay, everything looks really old. But that's just because there was accelerated decay during like the flood. Of course, that doesn't explain why that's in stepwise with independent measures like tree rings or ice cores or coral clocks or all this other stuff. But, too many clocks. Yeah, so many clocks. Too many clocks. A, a, a menagerie of clocks. But that being <laughs> said, like, let's just let that go for a minute. Yeah. You get the likes of Jason Lyle. Jason Lyle comes out here and he says, I'm with you. I don't think that there is... Uh, that everything was created to look old. Instead, I think that the earth was created within a white hole. So the earth is like outside of the conventional time scale of the rest of the universe where everything is happening much faster, essentially. It's this gradient of time is, is this proposed idea. It is bonkers. That and so sounds I, bonkers. I wanted, yeah, I wanted to see, um, so like is... Is time going to be relative in that fashion uh, to the degree of like 6,000 oh. years to 1 billion? Or Let's talk all... about the nature of time. Billion? Yay. Yes. I wanna. Please. Okay. So time, time is weird. Um, uh, because the way that you and I experience time um, is actually a function of the speed at which we are traveling through the universe, mm -hmm. right? So this all goes back to speed of light, real weird. The speed of light being Action. a non-reference -ref frame dependent constant means that we cannot travel them faster than the speed of light. And as we get close to the speed of light, three things happen. You get mass dilation, length dilation, and time dilation. Mm -hmm. So if I am standing still and you, Erica, um, start moving very close to the speed of light, what I will observe of you is- <laughs> <laughs> is um, I'll, you'll, you'll shrink, mm -hmm. you'll get smaller along the dimension that you're traveling, mm -hmm. right? Um, your mass will actually increase, right? Um, and time for you is moving slower than it is for me. So right. the way I like to say it is if you could travel at the speed of light, you would um, have infinite mass, uh, take up no space, um, and live forever. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be... Isn't that just mind boggling to me? Okay, yeah. I'm I'm like a total plebe and everything, but I really like the movie Interstellar and I, I know, love it. I know people okay, I'm glad to hear that because I always get nervous when I talk to people because people either love it or they hate it. And so I think it's really fun. And I mm -hmm. the last time in a movie theater that my mouth like 
fell open was the time dilation concept of the water planet versus being on the spaceship mm -hmm. because that was like it, when did, whenever that movie came out I was like a freshman or a sophomore in college or something like that and I remember seeing that and being like holy shit that's how that works that's how that works and I was like it blew my mind and so I guess the concept there is like being being close to this large black hole with infinite mass right versus mm -hmm. being so away. uh you're close to a large black hole so it's gravitational for there's it's exerting a force on you which makes you move really fast right right so oh i'm sorry continue okay so um so uh yeah, so so in this, if, if you uh, if you were traveling, let's say you got on a spaceship and left Earth and traveled really close to the speed of light and then came back, maybe 10 years passed for me, but one year passed for you. Right. Right. Um, by the way, this is experimentally confirmed. Um, this is how uh, 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 particle accelerators, you're right. accelerating particles close to the speed of light. Um, and this is actually very important. There are some particles that we can only measure because of that mass and time dilation effect. Mm -hmm. Wow, they're, inc they're incredibly short-lived and small, but because we're accelerating them so much, um, we we observe them to be larger and live longer. So we can right. actually take we can actually measure properties, it. right? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so this is this is absolutely experimentally confirmed every every day. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's very key. Yeah. Um. So uh, so let's see. So how could let's just use our brains for a second how could t t uh, so according to what's his face time is moving faster or slower for earth so for, for earth time would be relative to earth things outside of this recessed white hole that earth dwells within okay appears to be moving much faster so it appears to be much older okay so that would mean that Earth is moving slow relative to everything else. Right. That's what that would have to mean. Right. Um, I would because, imagine that would be inconsistent with expansion observations, first of all. Right, yeah, so we can measure, so like, okay, I can measure how fast this star is moving away from me, mm -hmm. how fast this star is moving away from me, and then how fast these stars are moving away from each other. Right. All of that should match up. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's like, what is that geometry too? Like you got like- Yeah, that's just kind of basic geometry. Um, uh, so what evidence would we see if we were in some kind of a uh, hole, if you will, moving um moving slow no that is what i just said would break it yeah right that's, like, that's what i was thinking right yeah it, even it, and something as simple as parallax being mm -hmm. able to break it it's almost like he lyle look and, and if memory serves he's like i want to say that he's got some a background in let me look it up doesn't me, he have a background in like astrophysics yeah so that's it seems like he should know better me. I, yeah. Um, uh, you know what? And the other question is like, is it just Earth or what about our solar system? What about the Milky Way? Right. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's literally an astrophysicist. Okay. So, I mean, maybe, maybe there's something to this that I'm not quite picking up on, but I can't see how that, I'm, I'm trying to reason through how you would know that. Right. So let me, okay, let me share. Well, I want to share my screen with you so that you can. Oh, let me give you oh, sure cool. have permission. Because uh, now I've got, listen, I've got you, I've got you captive here to talk about white holes. So I, and I love, love I've never been like in the same room with someone who knows enough about it to. Because kind of typically it. the idea of a white hole is the opposite of a black hole. A black hole, and we've just happened to have never observed a white hole, right? A black hole sucks everything in, a white hole would spit everything back out. Right, exactly. Right. Okay. Okay, so Humphreys has a model of the white hole cosmology. A white hole is like a black hole, except matter flies outwards from the white hole, whereas matter falls into a black hole. Near the boundary of a white hole, space and time are distorted. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, this distortion can be described as the stretching of fabric 
of the fabric of space and time progresses at a different rate depending on where you are. So this theory plays off general relativity to solve the distance starlight problem with gravitational time dilation. From an overview perspective, Dr. Humphreys challenges the commonly held assumption that the universe has no boundary. Running a bounded cosmos through general relativity results in a model that is not at all like the Big Bang and consistent with biblical creation. Essentially, in the white hole cosmology, all matter in the universe flew out of this white hole. This would have occurred during the creation week and the white hole would have vanished sometime during that week. Of course it vanishes. It, God forbid it's still there. Yeah. As matter left the white hole, gravitational time dilation occurred. The earth was near the center of the white hole, so time on earth passed much more slowly than at the near than time near the boundary of the white hole. So there are still problems with this issue, but as such as blue shifts and red shifts not matching what they should be. This model also holds some promise, so we encourage further work on this model. Okay, so I like that they just roast themselves at the end. Yeah, that is just kind of nonsense. So it's, I guess, instead of Okay, so instead of like a big bang, what God did apparently was he just, he had a bucket full of all the planets and the stars and he dumped it upside down. Yeah. And the last thing to fall out of the bucket was earth. And then we tossed the bucket away. It's gone forever. Yeah, it's uh. gone. It's to, let, can we see the remnants? Well, actually, I don't believe we've ever seen, and black holes are too long lived to see a black hole after it's kind of run out of energy, right? Black holes will never die. Okay. Um, black holes black holes are strange um so in the uh in the uh uh universe is a rubber sheet gravity model that is kind of useful to think about relativity sometimes um a black hole uh, so uh, uh earth sits on the rubber sheet and bends it around it that's gravity a black hole you have to think of as a rip in the rubber sheet um okay so and it's just Anything that gets close falls into that hole. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happens to it. It's gone forever. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> Ye yeeted, from, yeeted from our reality. I yeeted from our reality. Um, so, uh, so what causes, so what's really interesting here is it's uh, the, the force, right, is just gravity. And gravity is a universally attractive force. Gravity pulls things together. So it's the, the gravity of the black hole that pulls stuff in, right? So he's proposing a, a white hole, right? So, but you would have to tell me what force pushes things apart that's stronger than gravity. Right, right. Right, because he's saying we dumped out fully formed stars, yep. right? Yep. And pushed them out. There does not exist so that the, the fundamental forces are gravity, electromagnetic force, nuclear strong force, nuclear weak force. Right. right. Where's uh, five? Where's the fifth one? Where's, where's, where's this force? magic pushy force? There is, right. show me the pushy now. <laughs> show me the pushy force. So it would have to be a force that acts on large massive objects, right? right? Um, so nuclear forces um, act on really, really, really short distances, right? Right. Um, and uh, so we and so we would have to have a force that acts on rocks and hydrogen equally, right? Right. And it would like gravity does, but it would have to push instead of pull. Right. So if, if you're going to propose, so I I don't even understand the mechanism. And so then it would have to be, or there's like magic outer ring of gravity that's pulling everything towards it, right? Like that's that's the only other thing I could think of. It, either it, it, way. It, yeah, it's, yeah, you've got to be able, that's going to leave a trace of itself if it's pulling. And if it's pushing, then you need a new force. You need like, a new force. Right. And so to get that time dilation effect, right, you need, you basically need, a, you need the universe to be a flat earth where all the water just falls mm -hmm. off the edge. Yep. Right. Yeah, that solves, the flat earth solves everything. <laughs> it solves everything. Um, because you would need some type, some reason for all these things to be moving away from each other fast enough to have the same type of time dilation effect right. uh, that you do get with a black hole. Um, and you, you, again, you get that dilation effect with a black hole because its gravitational force is so strong, it pulls you so you accelerate and you move so fast. Yeah, right, right, right. Ah, oh, this, uh, this is a class. Okay, so, so. That's nonsense. Yeah, so, so we're sitting currently with, uh, yeah, with no, no solution. <laughs> they, they also have light in transit, which we already discussed, speed of light decay. So, so in your opinion, is it possible that the speed of light varies? 
or no. okay okay good speed yeah. of light again again the fact that the speed of light in the vacuum doesn't vary is strange so we double check a lot <laughs> <laughs> they, they have a they have a paragraph here that says evidence for a reduced speed of light decay is also lacking <laughs> and in centuries past the accuracy of measuring devices has been limited <laughs> okay <laughs> so okay all right, cool. Dude, and then you can, oh, fun fact, you can measure the speed of light with your microwave and a bar of chocolate if you want to. Okay, yeah, so got, folks, I mean, I don't know that you would want to, do it at home, do it at home. Yeah. They, they, it have at home. A, they have something called the Harnett model, which is Carmelian physics. It's, what is, Car who is, who is Carmel? I don't, Moshi Carmeli. <laughs> Was he sounds he sounds like he's fun at parties. He <laughs> sounds like he is fun. It was proposed by physicist John Harnett in a different approach to white hole cosmology, where a bounded universe was in four dimensions. This is assumed a fifth dimension, which is also still bounded. <laughs> All right. So well, this is actually I, I do like to bring up how many dimensions our universe has. Um, what? It's right? Somewhere between eleven and twenty-one, and yeah. that makes me really happy. It's it's a lot. I, I just think it's funny though that it's like. They're like, okay, 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 hold on, hold up, hold up. It works, but only if you have five dimensions. And you're like, but what about like 11 to 20? And they're like, no, 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 just five. five. So one additional. And there's a box. Yeah, and it's a box, right? It's not, yeah. What? Wait, that's actually, so something that does kind of drive me nuts. Uh, so when, when I've heard younger creationists talk about uh, the universe has to be like a closed, bounded system it has to have a boundary and i'm like well it's just the definition of universe is everything yeah so then the box is part of the universe by definition so and then they're like so this is the universe this is everything but then there's god <laughs> right and i'm like so explicitly outside of the out of the box right well and it's like the universe is expanding and then and this always hurts my brain which is why i stay to the squishy sciences but it's like the universe is expanding and then i'm like oh expanding into what and people are like that. So yeah, that's the thing. It's, the best way to think about it is it doesn't it doesn't expand into anything, right? It just right? Is it creates expanding. as it expands. That is yeah. It's it would someone explained it once like it's it's kind of like a balloon, you mm -hmm. know, and that it's um I think Leo Phileas did, which you should subscribe to. He does a lot of physics stuff. Um, okay. but he uh he explained it like um if you draw if you have a balloon that's inflated to like this size and you draw a point mm -hmm. here and a point on the side and you blow into the balloon, mm -hmm. it's not that those two points are necessarily moving apart. It's that the space between them is expanding. As yeah, the that's is. a good way to think about it. Which which helped me kind of wrap my brain around it in a sense that was like a uh, comprehensible to me. Cause I'm just like, ah, oh, man, I, I look at monkeys. like. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, uh, do. Um, oh, do you like that? The meme that is, uh, um monkey? do not lick the science oh the rock one yeah the, like, well, like sometimes thing. you lick rocks but i love the, the zoology one is sometimes the science licks you yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes and yeah boy does it or bites you one or the other i like that they okay they also have alternative synchrony theories conventions lyle einstein convention oh my god oh I'm, god i'm gonna throw myself into traffic this model, uh, <laughs> the Lyle Einstein convention, this model derives from passes, passages like Genesis 117 that says the stars were given, the stars were to give light to the earth. So it says, okay, it says, Dr. Lyle derived the Lyle Einstein synchrony convention, otherwise known as the anseotropic synchrony convention, which is based on an alternative convention that is a position-based physics as opposed to a velocity-based physics. What does that mean? That's a, I don't, I legitimately don't know. Okay. I, would, I would need to read more. In layman's terms, think of it like this. You leave on a jet from New York at 1 p.m. and you land at LA at 1 p.m. But you might say the flight took about five hours on the jet. Here's the difference. According to Einstein, when you approach the speed of light, time goes to zero. So if you rode on top of a light beam from a star that was billions of light years away from Earth, it took you no time to get there. So that five hour flight was a no hour flight for light. It was an instantaneous trip. Based on this convention, light left distant stars to, and arrived on Earth in no time. This fulfill, what? No, okay, no, because, uh, so here's the, that bad assumption. 
all that stuff I talked about with like time dilation and how Mm -hmm. time passes, it specifically doesn't apply to light. Yeah, right. Right? So that light is immune to all of that. Right. So you have to think about, so you can, we can divide the universe into three things. Um, and one of them, we don't know if it exists or not. Yeah. The, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the three things are things that travel slower than the speed of light, right? light, and things that travel faster than the speed of light. Which, mm, like. Yeah, right. That's one of the things like, that'd be cool if they existed. We don't know. We've never found them yet, but they could. Right. Um, See, it, like, it, it's, isn't it one of those things that like, theor- like the, theoretically it could work? But, but yeah. we don't know if anything has met that criteria. Yeah. So, so, okay. I, this, here's, a, I, 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 this gets me really excited. I've got a small little rant. Um, okay. Uh, so the, the most important thing about those three categories is that whatever category you're in, you mm-hmm. cannot leave. Right. Okay. Right? So we are humans. We travel slower than the speed of light, which actually is a very, very cool. Cause that means uh, the way that we experience time and the way that we travel through the universe is Um, we can, uh, we can travel to the future, right? We do so pretty slowly, right? (laughs) But we can travel into the future and we can observe the past. So a fun little thought experiment I like people to do is um, imagine that you had like a perfect telescope, Mm -hmm. right? So that wherever you pointed, you could perfectly see just like a movie, anything you looked at, and you could teleport. We don't need to worry about how you can teleport. You just yeah. can in this thought experiment. experiment. Yeah, anything goes. So teleport 20 million in light years away, point your telescope at Earth, and you'll see the Miocene. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Teleport 80 light years away, and you'll see, uh, you'll see World War II. Yeah. Oh, right? that's so cool. It's right. such a cool so concept. we have this ability to observe the past. We just mostly do it to other planets. Right. Yeah. We, right. Do, we can't reflect as well. Right. <clears throat> now, uh, light, uh, light does, it take, it does take time. <coughs> Sorry. No, don't worry about it. Light to get from one place to another. Um, now the, what is the experience of a single photon? Does that photon realize it's traveling? Great philosophical question there, Dr. Lyle, mm-hmm. right? I, I don't know. But <laughs> so it may very well be that the photon doesn't notice, right? That it, time is passing for us, right? Right. But it would be incorrect to say that no time passed. Right, right. right. Okay. All right, cool. All right, we can check that one off. Um, yeah off the list. That is all. I love that. I love that mini rant. That's such a a romantic way of thinking about it. I love it. You can also think about those things that travel faster than the speed of light. They would be the opposite. They could see the future and travel to the past. Ah, which is so spooky, right? So spooky. That's how oracles exist. Yeah. yeah, That's the fates, right? Like, (laughs) or it's, uh, it's Merlin from once in future King, right? Yeah. Merlin Merlin just was a tachyon. Yeah, 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 it's it's fine. It's fine. It works. <laughs> the the last thing they have here is something called the Dasha solution, which I have also never heard about. Um, but it says it says here we would like to okay, this is a miraculous option. Okay, so we don't really care about that because oh, that doesn't that I have to it. say, if your theories about the universe, like seriously, if you're understanding if if you can replace how you understand the universe, like if your argument is like, but God did it, just re- please, re- for just a minute, replace God with Gandalf. Yeah, or or like um, Cthulhu, you Cthulhu know? Cthulhu, like- or, or I don't know, Imana. Yeah. <laughs> or Inanna, however you say her name. Like, if you can, it, and, and does it still feel robust? Does it still feel like, like if you were insulted when I just said replace God with Gandalf, but if your answer is magic, please explain the difference to me maybe revisit your theology oh well and that's that's the thing right like it, and we said this earlier it's like if you unabashedly are like yes it's magic and that's mm-hmm. just the stance i'm going to take uh and i don't really care about the empiricism of it then then my response is going to be like well i can't prove you wrong so whatever like that's not really empirical i'm just going to step aside uh it, it the problem comes when they're like some of it's magic but some of it's science and it's only when it's convenient for me right uh, and then you're like Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, then don't, 
don't parade around like it's, you know, straight science because it's not. Right. Um, and also like uh, understand what science is and what it can do, right? Science right. deals with uh, processes of the natural world mm -hmm. and its robustness is in its predictive power, right? Like, oh. you know, and so uh, uh, science does lots of good things, right? It, 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 Application but, is key. Yeah, absolutely. Um, however, like if your answer, if, if your honest answer is magic, right, or miracles, if that makes you feel better, um, you can't expect science to point to that. It, because it, by definition, it wouldn't. It would be it, metaphysical, which exactly. science deals with the natural, as you said, it, it right. is definitionally outside of the scope. It's like yeah. the, the end of the paper. It's like, oh, that question is outside of the scope of this paper. It's like, yes. Yep. Well, yeah. That's the best. Once you learn that answer for, yeah. you know, it's the best, it's the best grad school trick. I was like, right. oh, it's an excellent question. It was a little beyond the scope of this one. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. I've already. I'm not seriously heard... taking notes because I forgot to check that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Keying that one up for the, for the eventual dissertation, you know, get ready. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention with regard to cosmology, because this is something that I, I feel I have never seen any young earth creationists kind of touch, but I think it's quite interesting, um, mm -hmm. is within the bounds of our solar system, uh, natural geologic processes and, and the accumulation of things on the surface of planets uh, or the degradation of things. So like Saturn's rings, we mm -hmm. know that they've got a shelf life. Um, we know what that shelf life is or the accumulation of ice on Europa, right? We know that that mm -hmm. takes a specific amount of time. Um, the same with, with Mars. We can look at Mars and we can say, given the conditions on Mars now, we can track that backwards and we can know that two-ish billion years ago, Mars, Mars could have potentially been quite lush uh, mm -hmm. compared to its, its current status. And, and I'm not sure, I think that kind of falls within that deception arc that we were just discussing. Why do these realities exist for other planets in our system? Yeah, I mean, another great one is like, so the way that you date uh, a, a relative dating method for objects in the solar system is actually crater counts. Yeah, um, right. So uh, uh, a, a surface that has lots of impact craters is older than a surface with not lots of impact craters, right? <laughs> um, so the surface of the moon, right, heavily cratered, right? It's almost... Uh, uh, almost like just covered in craters. Yeah, pockmarked with them. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, hey, hey team, there's not enough things flying around our solar system to cause that many craters. We know that that's because there was, uh, so those are mostly caused by the late heavy bombardment, which is about 4 billion years ago. Mm. Um, and think of it as the last ditch effort of all the little bits that didn't get formed into planets escaping running out of the solar system they hit a lot of things on the way out right yeah um so that was the late heavy bombardment but again if you're looking at a challenge for young earth creationism would be okay the surface of the moon is older than the surface of the earth um that's because we recycle our crust right um and the moon does not um but like where are all the things that cause those craters on the moon and why aren't they here now 6,000 years isn't enough to get rid of them. So also too, sorry, I'm trying to, my, my camera like died for a quick second. Oh, no worries. Is that better? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, also kind of interesting in that aspect too is, you know, because quite frequently, I, I don't know if you've heard about the hydroplate hypothesis, but it's this I, I bonkers, bonkers, bonkers flood idea, flood geology idea. Yeah. Um, and it involves explaining away the cratering of the moon uh, by saying that when the fountains of the great deep burst, they were so powerful that they jettisoned earth rock <clears throat> into the moon that slammed into, which of course. Uh, so quick issue, Mercury also heavily cratered. So is Pluto. Yeah. <laughs> Ex exactly. At first, of that, there's all of that, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> let's just start there. Let's just start there. And then there's like, and, and this is my, my favorite thing, because Walt Brown, the guy who made the hydroplate hypothesis, you know, he, uh, he's, he's the guy who said, yeah, so we're looking at a lot of, we're looking at a lot of energy uh, in order to move the continents, jettison earth rock into space, because his idea is that 
despite the fact of, of massive iridium content in most of our meteorites, his idea is that all meteors and impact events on Earth were actually just Earth rock falling back down. Um, it's not, yes, it's as batshit as it sounds. It really yeah, is. Yeah, I actually, my undergraduate research was in impact craters. Really? I can tell you, yeah, I can tell you definitively that a rock going up and coming back down does not have enough energy to leave that type of impact crater. Okay. Oh, that, but, that's actually, okay, I might have to click this in because my next bite size bus is on impact events. So I might have to click this. But yeah, yeah that's, yeah. It, it, I, I, one of my friends is, uh, a, he graduated with a, a bachelor's in physics. And so I said, out of curiosity, like, let's take the top 20 impact events that we know of. Those are just the ones we know of, right? Uh, and and that that heat from all of those impact events occurring within a six month period, uh, it's catastrophic. Yeah, because one, a, a small impact crater, something that would just leave a simple crater, not not um, a, a multi-ring crater or a complex crater. Right. Uh, so the simplest, least energetic type of impact event you can get um, would be, oh, minimum, one impact event would be minimum a hundred times our most powerful nuclear weapon. Oh, beautiful. Right? Like, <laughs> beautiful. It's just, yeah, the, the, the impact events... The funny thing is, is when you, when you take Walt's estimate of his own hypothesis for heat, you get the energy, the thermal energy of over 1,000 trillion one megaton H-bombs per square meter of water per day of the flood. Oh, that's no. all the energy we're talking here. It's it's, and that's the energy he gives. This isn't other people who are criticizing. This is him who was like, oh, yeah, it's a lot of energy, like that. Ah. I don't know what we'll we're figure doing. it out. Yeah, that's someone else's problem, but yeah. Okay. Impact God. events. What's your favorite impact event? Ooh. Oh, uh, there is a beautiful crater on the, um, is it Callisto, the icy moon of Jupiter? Okay. Yeah. Um, it is a, uh, so what's very, very cool about impact events. Um, so crater comes in and, or an asteroid or whatever have you comes in, it hits the surface. The energy there is so intense. It instantly is going to vaporize the impactor, mm -hmm. right? So that instantly vaporizes. And then the rock underneath it that it's hitting momentarily liquefies. Oh, right? oh that's so wild. And so what you get a simple crater is just like a simple bowl a complex crater, think about what happens if you like put a drop of water and let it drop into um, a bowl of water, you get that little uh, spike that comes up, right? It kind of like rebounds a little bit. Right. So uh, imagine lock, rock goes liquid enough to get that peak come up, but then it freezes. Oh, that's, so that's a moon in Jupiter? Yeah. So those are our complex craters. And then even more energetic events, you get ripples in the rock. Uh -huh. um, and those freeze, they solidify. So there's one on Callisto that has like 13 rings. So it was just enormous. It was just, and it also has to do with the material. Right. Um, so there's uh, Mare Oriental on the moon is a multi-ring crater. It has like three, uh, three rings and a distinct central peak. Um, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Out, out of curiosity, what's the biggest crater on earth? Do you know? Um, it's not that, uh, there, there aren't many big ones. There are only simple craters on earth. And that's going to be because uh, there's, I know there's one down in Mexico. There's one like under some ice uh, there. So there's meteor, what meteor basin out in Arizona or Nevada somewhere, yeah, yeah, <laughs> somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah. west of me. Um, uh, but since the earth recycles its crust, they, uh, it erases them. It erases so. them. So uh, we don't have uh, impact events from 4 billion years ago that would have been like some of them. And also our moon is very good at snatching. Uh, things tend to run into the moon instead of us. Right. Um, so the moon, prote the moon protects us in a lot of ways. Um, is there cratering on both sides of the moon or is there a, a difference in how the cratering? Uh, the difference that you see, so the moon does have a bimodal topography. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, when you look up at the moon, you see the dark bits uh, mm -hmm. and then the light bits. That's the mare or the dark bits. Galileo thought they were seas. So mare is Latin for sea. That's so um, cool though. Yeah. And then the light bits are called the highlands. Those are uh, geologically very different. The mare are basaltic material um, and they are slightly less heavily cratered. So they are a slightly younger surface. Um, so basalt material that is um, almost like volcanic rock. Um, 
And so, and then the highlands are made predominantly of a northicite. So they're compositionally different. We think probably those mare were formed by very large impact events that came in and caused melt, right? Okay. So it melted part of the moon. That's so um, And then basically made volcanic rock that, yeah. that then solidified and was there. Uh, there's actually very interesting gravitational um, anomalies. The moon's gravitational field is bonkers. It's very strange. What, um, what do we know? Um, I think it is related to the fact that the Okay, so the you know the Earth has like crust and then the mantle and then we, we're a differentiated body, right. right? So we go from our crust to a silica mantle to a um, nickel iron core. That's right. because when the Earth formed, lots of energy we melted. The yeah. whole Earth yeah. melted, yeah. and silica know. is lighter than iron and nickel. So the so heavy metal, the enough. iron and nickel sink to the center <laughs> and kind of like con congealed <laughs> exactly um the moon its size is just on the cusp mm -hmm. um so like uh uh that its formation it may have not fully melted okay. it's right on the boundary of the size to make a fully differentiated body versus not a fully differentiated body so, so we don't so so what's it does it have a core don't know. Okay. Um, we don't know. Um, there are moonquakes. That's a mm -hmm. thing that happens, which is interesting. That's so weird. Um, so weird. But we like turned off the seismometers. Why did we do that? I, I don't know. There were size. There are seismometers on the moon that Apollo missions left. And they're and off. They're off. <laughs> Can we turn them back on? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm so sad because that's uh, you use seismic waves as how you map the interior of planets. Right. Like right. theoretically, so, so theoretically, we the tech is way better now. So like theoretically, we could take something up there that would actually be able to tell us if there was like a core and shit like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, and yet and yet the military defense budget. <laughs> and, I know. Yet. <laughs> and yet. Um, yeah. So all of that to say, so, the, so if you think about like Earth, we are, if you take a slice of earth, mm -hmm. right, it pretty much looks the same, right? right? Uh, if you take a slice of the moon, maybe not. Right. So yeah, bimodal. So one half might be slightly different than the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Um, and the interior structure, we don't really know what's going on. It could yeah. be really strange, which would what could definitely affect its uh, uh, gravitational field. Right. That's and all. we only mapped its gravitational field. That was the Grail mission um, in that launched in 2012. Yeah. So, okay. So what do you, what do you suppose? This is the last thing I'll ask. Cause I, I've okay. kept you for almost two hours over. Oh, you're good. Two this and a half hours. Fun. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. The time just flies by. I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll probably, I'll probably break this into a couple segments. I'll probably awesome. one on, on right. General Miocene climate, one on how paleo environments bust young earth creationism and then a cosmology. Um, and then maybe if it's okay with you, I'll do one on like the, younger creationist cosmology attempts so like the talking about yeah. like bulls versus all the like maybe a couple segments and um i'll just i mean it'll be great because it'll be uh i don't know i think people are really gonna like it this has been a very fun conversation yeah so, this okay. has been super fun and i you know totally have friends and normal social interactions and this hasn't been really refreshing <laughs> <laughs> listen i feel i feel the same way honest to god it's like i all my friends are back in London because that's mm. who I'm spending the past nine months with. And so, yeah. like, and, you know, all my friends here in the United States from undergrad are spread out now. So it's like, I got no, I don't know where they all, it's, it's me yeah. and my fiance and our dogs yeah. and my sister. Um, but we, he and I were actually talking the other day about the, um, about Europa, because I didn't know anything about Europa. And I, I subscribe, I'm subscribed to this channel called CSEA. Are you, okay. subscribed to them? you might not, I don't know. I'm not subscribed to them. They're cool. You should sub to them. It's all, it's all um, like astronomy stuff. And they have this really okay. interesting bit on Europa. And I was like, oh, Europa's cool. I've heard that Europa is a cool candidate, literally cool candidate for like life. And so I've decided yeah. to watch it. And I was so blown away by what, first of all, what we know about it. But second of all, I was blown away by this idea that it's, it's frozen for like a hundred kilometers or something deep. It's just so deep. And the idea is theoretically that based off of how, how it's heated and what its potential geology is like and, and uh, seismography or tectonics, let's say, are mm -hmm. like, there might be like 
almost like a sponge, like underground lakes scattered yeah. throughout the crust. Yeah. And I was thinking about that and I was like, holy shit, that's so cool. Like you're essentially, you've essentially got a million Petri dishes just yeah. out in the surface with yeah. liquid water and potentially getting thermal energy either from below or from the sun. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, it's going to be so cool uh, to eventually find that out. And then I was like, I'm going to be dead before we know that. <laughs> I was like, God damn it. Because <laughs> I was thinking uh, about it. And apparently yeah. the mission is like, they're going to, I think one of the next couple of missions is we're, we're sending another orbiting probe. But they were talking about how it's very difficult to land on Europa because of these naturally forming ice spikes or something like that. Yeah. Anyways, I wanted to get your opinion. Do you think, what do you think about Europa as a, as a potential candidate? It's a good one. It's a very good candidate because um, it has the things we think you need for life, right? Yeah. It has, it has liquid. So what you need, right? You want water that can exist in all three phases. Mm -hmm. So you've got liquid and ice. Um, and vapor. And, and vapor. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it should be warm enough. And so it, it, in, in theory, um, it's, it's, it's got a lot of potential if we're looking for life in our solar system, right. but I've got to look, take a second look at this. Cause I got so excited about the potential signs of life on Venus. I saw that. Yeah. the phos <sighs> It's phosphine. Yeah. Phosphine. phosphine. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah don't, um, it hasn't, cause there's two opinions, right? There's an idea that mm -hmm. they're finding phosphine and then some other people are thinking that it's not phosphine or that it's geologically formed phosphine. Yeah. So, okay. So the, uh, phosphine will, uh, naturally occur in like the, in Venus's atmosphere, right? So there are known chemical processes that will produce it, um, uh, based off of the initial paper that I, I did read, I haven't read any of the follow-up stuff with it. Mm -hmm. Um, the concentrations of phosphine that they found couldn't be explained by those natural processes. Wouldn't that be wild? And that actually makes me really excited when we're thinking about um, alien life is that Venus was the last place we thought to look. Yeah. Right? It's so hot and just love cool. talking about uh, hot and toxic and it, it, its surface is molten. Yeah. <laughs> right? But so the idea that you have um, uh, like, I don't know, microbial whatever life that, that lives fully in the atmosphere no, no water, right? Um, and, it's dreamophilic and, to the nth degree. You yeah, know? Like we're just talking but, about life that is just the definition of robust. Right, but that makes me so. I I hope it's real. So it might be there. There's some con con contention over the the measurement of the phosphine. Like maybe they overestimated how much was mm -hmm. there, and maybe how much is there can be explained by natural processes. Right. That's kind of the, that's kind of where the debate's at. We're getting another close look at it here in 2022 though, right? Where we can double check. I think or so. Up, up, maybe it's late this year. I don't know. I, I remember reading it and being like, God damn it. That's so long. Like, <laughs> but, yeah, that's actually why I, um, cause my undergrad, uh, research and all that stuff was all in planetary science. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized I couldn't do planetary science as a career when I was, I was interning at NASA Goddard. It was super fun. That's um, awesome. when, when messenger start made it to orbit Mercury, mm -hmm. and there was a, a, a guy, a, a researcher there at NASA that I was, you know, kind of working under. Um, and messenger, it took 10 years to get there. And he had been on the project that whole time. Right. And I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do my, have my career doing that. And it's very if, cool. I'm really glad someone's doing it. What but the thing too, is like, I think about funding for projects that are like six months and how yeah. like you could get two months in and they're like, nope, funding's not coming through. Like, what if you get a 10 year project going and then they're like, sorry, then you can't. Yeah. Like, the, that's, like, that's like the heartbreak of your life. Uh-huh. Oh, well, you know, um, I don't know what the rate is now. We, we seem to have better success rates, but uh, first Mars missions, it was like 50-50, whether it was going to get there. Yeah. Could yeah. you imagine oh my designing God. those instruments and that experiment and the, the millions to billions of dollars it costs to get stuff and then it didn't make it? It's so, it's so frustrating too. Cause like, 
So, so my, one of my big things that I hope I live to see, I hope this yeah. happens in, in our lifetime, but like, I would love to see what the samples from those water flows on the side of Mars that has that surface liquid water for part of the year. Um, do you know Mars, the, the liquid water flows on the surface? There's no liquid water on Mars' surface, in, unless I missed something. Hold on. I think it was near, no, this is on lakes. Yes, yeah, small quantities. Oh, at the poles? No, no, it's like brines. They're okay. like they're like brines from underwater lakes that during part of the year come to the surface. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm tracking now. I'm, I, I, I thought you were referring to like surface water that was oh, frozen no, like the, the, and the then- leaching that like gets- it like leaching, gets, okay. Yes, yeah, it yes, like yes, gets yes. up. It's not flowing like in a flow. I meant like- how Yeah, it okay, flows, kind of. gotcha. Okay, now sorry, now I'm tracking. I don't know <laughs> But I, I think my thinking, right, is that it's like, okay, um, we don't actually know how common life is, but based off of how life operates here on the planet, it seems pretty hardy. Um, yeah. And it seems like if you can get it going, it's mm -hmm. pretty hard to exterminate once it's there, mm -hmm. um, at least in its entirety. I mean, you, you, you have like the Permian, which was the planet's best shot at exterminating everything and things yeah. were still kicking around, like big things, not even, you didn't even get like a microbial level extinct. It, things were still kicking around doing okay. Um, most things were, but some things were, <laughs> but it's like, uh, theoretically, if, if Mars ever did have life, even mm -hmm. microbial, I would imagine that there is the possibility that it could still thrive in these very isolated yeah. pockets. Yes. That, that's definitely a, a working theory. Which would be I, like, I would love I mean, the fear, right? Is that you get that, you get there and you like take it. And, um, and you come back and it's either there's nothing or you've got contamination, which would just be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, well, and right now we don't have the technology for a return mission. Right, right. Um, we don't have a way to, uh, we, we don't have a way to make a space, a shuttle, a rocket, whatever you want to call it. Land and then come back, right? Like, right, right. I That's, wonder it would be cool if, I mean, you know, I know the SpaceX or whatever was talking about it, but like, if you, if you got a group of people who could get there and stay for a while, maybe they could construct something there, but like, yeah, it's you, right now it's fuel. Yeah. It's the, oh really it's, there's not enough fuel. You can't carry enough fuel to get to Mars and land back. launch and get back. Okay. So I didn't know. Uh, that. Yeah. So fuel is the problem. Um, I am for, uh, I mean, there's some research into this, uh, uh, but I, I'm certainly of the opinion that like um, nuclear powered space shuttles are gonna be the way to go. Nuclear power in my, I'm with you on that. I think that um, if we're trying to get to 100% renewables, that nuclear, nuclear is going to be a necessary step. Like yeah. we have to find a way. And people are so fucking chicken shit about that. It's like, okay, yeah, like, yes. I I like to point out that the United States Navy trains 18 year old children do this. <laughs> to operate nuclear reactors, has been doing so since the 50s. There are every single submarine, every carrier is powered by a nuclear reactor, has been it's like since the 50s. Zero zero oh, accident you know that yeah but chernobyl and three mile island and fukushima scared people though and people are like mm -mm, mm, hey crazy. how many how many do you think nuclear related deaths there were at fukushima if memory serves it's like what two something like that zero, zero. okay straight up goose egg in is zero or three mile island was the same wasn't it, or yeah. Was it yeah okay it was just three mile island yeah there was no um and fukushima um, would have been, was uh, the, the nuclear, so what actually happened with Fukushima? Um, uh, okay, so they shut down the reactor successfully, huzzah. Um, reactor shut down. Um, there are still, uh, okay, so when, when uranium fissions, mm -hmm. the two pieces left over are very radioactive. They rapidly decay, right? right? Which produces a lot of heat. Um, that's called decay heat, and it can be, it's, 
it's single digits amount of reactor, total reactor power, right. but it's a non-trivial amount of power, right? Um, so the reactor was completely shut down, uh, but uh, the w pumps that would remove the decay heat um, were connected to the city power grid, okay. which was down. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a way to remove the decay heat. Uh, there's a very simple engineering fix to that right. that is used in, um, I think, all U.S. plants. Right. That's so. The thing is, that was not a hard problem to solve. That wasn't something that would have been hard to prevent. And I, if memory serves, the the Chernobyl incident too was a rather simple fix of like dropping the things into water before they overheat. Yeah. So the let me just put this. So the U.S. Navy has not had a single nuclear react accident. There is a whole Wikipedia page of Russian yeah. Navy <laughs> nuclear accidents. I'm not here to throw shade at the Russians, but their safety procedures for nuclear things, not great. The thing, yeah, the Russians, the thing about the Russians is they were kind of just like, I mean, we want to know the answer and like, we could just like risk people's lives and like get the answer faster. Most of the time and they were just like, oh, let's just do it. What are you going yeah. to do? You know, um, do you know about the, uh, the Oklo natural reactor? Yes, that is the coolest thing in the world. So oh, cool. I, I so cool. I um that's actually one of the sources that I use when I'm talking to creationists and stuff like that about how the constancy of decay. Um yeah. because it's this natural reactor sitting there doing reactor things, right? And yeah. it's like we know that I mean it's recorded right there in the rocks. Yeah. Well, and that's the idea that like well, you don't know that radioactive decay has never changed. It's like, dude, dude, we've tried to change decay constants. That's a thing we try to do a lot. It'd be no one has been successful. economic implications, massive right. economic implications. And so like, if you can demonstrate that that's true, do please it. go collect your Nobel prize. Yep. Right. Cause that is the level of, of, of discovery that that would be. Yeah. Um, I was reviewing a thing on uh, uranium lead dating and zircons, which, mm -hmm. oh my God, I can talk all day about that. I, but that was, uh, that's not the video that's up already. I'm going to put that one up next week. Yeah. Um, but they started talking about helium diffusion and my brain just melted yeah. because of, they were like, the words they were saying were so dumb. I couldn't even think through it because, oh my gosh. So because, here's the thing. Diffusion is a process we know is affected by temperature. So they're ranting and raving about you don't know that the temperature didn't affect the decay constant. Like I did know it affected diffusion rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God they, damn. They love that helium, the, the the helium of um of like the helium problem or whatever that they cite yeah. all the freaking time. So I pulled up some real papers, and do you know what helium is used for? It's used as a thermal clock in right. mm -hmm. it tells you about the thermal history <laughs> yeah it's it, their their whole their whole thing too is this they don't have a concept of when rates can change and when mm -hmm. rates don't change uh so that guy i was telling you about earlier nathaniel jensen he says mutation rates are constant um that and, doesn't seem true it's 100 <laughs> observably not true. I'm sorry, I'm not a biologist, but it, I can think of how to change mutation rates. It's, yeah, it's literally the most bonkers thing ever. And <laughs> the funny thing is, is like mutation rates vary two degrees within human populations today, let alone through time. But recently there was an interesting paper that took pedigrees of uh, all the great apes, humans included. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, found, they, they found like empirical supported evidence for a definitive hominin slowdown of mutation okay. rates. So we've been, our mutation rate has, is slow compared to the other great apes. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because in his book, when he's talking about this, he says, well, mutation rates are, we're going to go ahead and use a constant rate for mutation rates, keeping in line with the uniformitarianism of conventional science. A real question. Is that a word you have heard? heard outside of young earth creationism uniformitarianism not since like the 30s like okay since like since lyle since Hutt yeah. lyle were like oh uniformitarianism is basically the idea that we can take processes that are occurring today and extrapolate them into the past and then my geologist friend um actually told me he was like yeah they literally teach something called actualism 
which is the concept of uniformitarianism combined with the acknowledgement that local catastrophe occurs because yeah. that's just and they called it actualism to hit, hit home the point that yeah. yes this is what we see <laughs> like yeah well and so like and my when they were trying to when i was watching a young earth creationist person explain what uniformitarianism was it was like what it sounded like he's saying is that things happen the way we observe them to happen unless we have good reason to think otherwise right right so and my head immediately went to decay constants speed yep. of light mm -hmm. these are or like the plank length right, right. things that, that are like constant. universal constants that don't have to be that way you know what i mean yeah. like they're, they're they're arbitrary in the sense that the laws of physics are arbitrary right like right they, but but there are things that we have never observed to be different. And so we shouldn't assume that they were different in the past unless we have a good reason. That's exactly, that's exactly it. And that's how I put okay. it. So like, you can argue that that is the case, but you have to provide a precedent for it. You have to yes. be able to say, okay, under this condition, this may happen based off of either a set of data that I've observed from the past or mm -hmm. a, a lab work that we've done or simulation yeah. even. Like, yeah, they, give me a computer model. Like, these guys, these guys will literally like scoff at using simulations and then turn around and show up with a, a fucking ideology instead of anything. I would love, I would love to throw, um, if you're going to scoff at simulations, then you should like next time a hurricane report comes in do nothing uh-huh right because that's all numerical weather modeling mm -hmm. that's all numerical those are all numerical simulations Mo modeling is like the backbone of any predictive science which is to say all science like all science. it's like yeah anyways <laughs> i i have kept you for almost three hours thank you <laughs> we so should, i should probably go yeah thank <laughs> you so much for this conversation i i really really enjoyed it um this was super fun yeah it adds 100 percent